the amusements of the people number one by charles dickens as one half of the world is said not to know how the other half lives so it may be affirmed that the upper half of the world neither knows nor greatly cares how the lower half amuses itself believing that it does not care mainly because it does not know we purpose occasionally recording a few facts on this subject the general character of the lower class of dramatic amusements is a very significant sign of a people and a very good test of their intellectual condition we design to make our readers acquainted in the first place with a few of our experiences under this head in the metropolis it is probable that nothing will ever root out from among the common people an innate love they have for dramatic entertainment in some form or other it would be a very doubtful benefit to society we think if it could be rooted out the polytechnic institution in regent street where an infinite variety of ingenious models are exhibited and explained and where lectures comprising a quantity of useful information on many practical subjects are delivered is a great public benefit and a wonderful place but we think a people formed entirely in their hours of leisure by polytechnic institutions would be an uncomfortable community we would rather not have to appeal to the generous sympathies of a man of five-and-twenty in respect of some affliction of which he had no personal experience who had passed all his holidays when a boy among cranks and cogwheels we should be more disposed to trust him if he had been brought into occasional contact with a maid and a magpie if he had made one or two diversions into the forest of bondy or even had gone the length of a christmas pantomime there is a range of imagination in most of us which no amount of steam engines will satisfy and which the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations itself will probably leave unappeased the lower we go the more natural it is that the best relished provision for this should be found in dramatic entertainments as at once the most obvious the least troublesome and the most real of all the escapes of the literal world joe whelks of the new cut lambeth is not much of a reader has no great store of books no very commodious room to read in no very decided inclination to read and no power at all of presenting vividly before his mind's eye what he read about but put joe in the gallery of the victoria theatre show him doors and windows in the scene that will open and shut and that people can get in and out of tell him a story with these aids and by the help of live men and women dressed up confiding to him their innermost secrets in voices audible half a mile off and joe will unravel a story through all its entanglements and sit there as long after midnight as you have anything left to show him accordingly the theatres to which mr whelks resorts are always full and whatever changes of fashion the drama knows elsewhere it is always fashionable in the new cut the question then might not unnaturally arise one would suppose whether mr whelks education is at all susceptible of improvement through the agency of his theatrical tastes how far it is improved at present our readers shall judge for themselves in affording them the means of doing so we wish to disclaim any grave imputation on those who are concerned in ministering to the dramatic gratification of mr whelks heavily taxed wholly unassisted by the state deserted by the gentry and quite unrecognized as a means of public instruction the higher English drama has declined. Those who would live to please Mr. Whelks must please Mr. Whelks to live. It is not the manager's province to hold the mirror up to nature, but to Mr. Whelks, the only person who acknowledges him. If in like manner the actor's nature, like the dyer's hand, becomes subdued to what he works in, the actor can hardly be blamed for it. He grinds hard at his vocation, is often steeped in direful poverty, 
and lives at the best in a little world of mockeries. It is bad enough to give away a great estate six nights a week and want a shilling, to preside at imaginary banquets hungry for a mutton chop, to smack the lips over a tankard of toast and water and declaim about the mellow produce of the sunny vineyard on the banks of the Rhine, to be a rattling young lover with the measles at home, and to paint sorrow over with burnt cork and rouge, without being called upon to despise his vocation, too. If he can utter the trash to which he is condemned with any relish, so much the better for him, heaven knows, and peace be with him. A few weeks ago we went to one of Mr. Wilkes's favorite theaters, to see an attractive melodrama called May Morning or the Mystery of 1715 and the Murder. We had an idea that the former of these titles might refer to the month in which either the mystery or the murder happened, but we found it to be the name of the heroine, the pride of Keswick Vale, who was called May Morning, after a common custom among the English peasantry from her bright eyes and merry laugh. Of this young lady it may be observed, in passing, that she subsequently sustained every possible calamity of human existence in a white muslin gown with blue tucks, and that she did every conceivable and inconceivable thing with a pistol that could anyhow be affected by that description of firearms. The theater was extremely full, the prices of admission were, to the boxes, a shilling, to the pit sixpence, to the gallery threepence. The gallery was of enormous dimensions. Among the company in the front row, we observed Mr. Whelks, and overflowing with occupants. It required no close observation of the attentive faces rising one above another to the very door in the roof and squeezed and jammed in, regardless of all discomforts, even there, to impress a stranger with a sense of its being highly desirable, to lose no possible chance of effecting any mental improvement in that great audience. The company in the pit were not very clean or sweet-savored, but there were some good-humored young mechanics among them with their wives. These were generally accompanied by the baby, insomuch that the pit was a perfect nursery. No effect made on the stage was so curious as the looking down on the quiet faces of these babies fast asleep, after looking up at the staring sea of heads in the gallery. There were a good many cold-fried souls in the pit besides, and a variety of flat stone bottles of all portable sizes. The audience in the boxes was of much the same character, babies and fish excepted, as the audience in the pit. A private in the foot guard sat in the next box, and a personage who wore pins on his coat instead of buttons, and was in such a damp habit of living as to be quite moldy, was our nearest neighbor. In several parts of the house we noticed some young pickpockets of our acquaintance, but as they were evidently there as private individuals and not in their public capacity, we were little disturbed by their presence. For we consider the hours of idleness passed by this class of society as so much gain to society at large, and we do not join in the whimsical sort of lamentation that is generally made over them when they are found to be unoccupied. As we made these observations, the curtains rose, and we were presently in possession of the following particulars. Sir George Elmore, a melancholy baronet, with every appearance of being in that advanced stage of indigestion in which Mr. Morrison's patients usually are when they happened to hear through Mr. Mote of the surprising effect of his vegetable pills, was found to be living in a very large castle, in the society of one round table, two chairs, and Captain George Elmore, his supposed son, the child of mystery and the man of crime. The captain, in addition to an undutiful habit of bullying his father, 
on all occasions, was a prey to many vices, foremost among which may be mentioned his desertion of his wife, Estella de Neva, a Spanish lady, and his determination unlawfully to possess himself of May mourning, M.M. M. being then on the eve of marriage to William Stanmore, a cheerful sailor with very loose legs. The strongest evidence at first of the captain's being the child of mystery and man of crime was deducible from his boots, which being very high and wide and apparently made of sticking plaster, justified the worst theatrical suspicions to his disadvantage. And indeed, he presently turned out as ill as could be desired, getting into May Morning's cottage by the window after dark, refusing to unhand May Morning when required to do so by that lady, waking May Morning's only surviving parent, a blind old gentleman with a black ribbon over his eyes, whom we shall call Mr. Stars, as his name was stated in the bill thus, Star, 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 and showing himself desperately bent on carrying off May morning by force of arms. Even this was not the worst of the captain, for being foiled in his diabolical purpose temporarily by means of knives and pistols, providentially caught up and directed at him by May morning, and finally for the time being by the advent of Will Stanmore, he caused one slink, his adherent, to denounce Will Stanmore as a rebel and got that cheerful mariner carried off and shut up in prison. At about the same period of the captain's career, there suddenly appeared in his father's castle a dark-complexioned lady of the name of Manuela, a Zingara woman from the Pyrenean Mountains, the wild wanderer of the heath and the pronouncer of the prophecy, who threw the melancholy baronet, his supposed father, into the greatest confusion by asking him what he had upon his conscience, and by pronouncing mysterious rhymes concerning the child of mystery and the man of crime, to a low trembling of fiddles. Matters were in this state when the theatre resounded with applause, and Mr. Whelks fell into a fit of unbounded enthusiasm, consequent on the entrance of Michael the Mendicant. At first, we referred something of the cordiality with which Michael the Mendicant was greeted to the fact of his being made up with an excessively dirty face, which might create a bond of union between himself and a large majority of the audience. But it soon came out that Michael the Mendicant had been hired in old time by Sir George Elmore to murder his, Sir George Elmore's, elder brother, which he had done notwithstanding which little affair of honor, Michael was in reality a very good fellow, quite a tender-hearted man, who on hearing of the captain's determination to settle Will Stanmore, cried out, What more blood? and fell flat, overpowered by his nice sense of humanity. In like manner, in describing that small error of judgment into which he had allowed himself to be tempted by money, this gentleman exclaimed, I struck him down, I fell in error. And further, he remarked with honest pride, I have lived uh, as a beggar, a roadsider vagrant, but no crime since then has stained these hands. All these sentiments of the worthy man were hailed with showers of applause, and when in the excitement of his feelings on one occasion after a soliloquy, he went off on his back, kicking and shuffling along the ground, after the manner of bold spirits in trouble who object to be taken to the station house, the cheering was tremendous. And to see how little harm he had done after all, Sir George Elmore's elder brother was not dead, not he. He recovered after this sensitive creature had felled in error, and putting a black ribbon over his eyes to disguise himself, went and lived in a modest retirement with his only child. In short, Mr. Stars was the identical individual. When Will Stanmore turned out to be the wrongful Sir George Elmore's son, 
instead of the child of mystery and man of crime, who turned out to be Michael's son, a change having been effected in revenge by the lady from the Pyrenean mountains, who became the wild wonder of the heath in consequence of the wrongful Sir George Elmore's perfidy to her and desertion of her. Mr. Stars went up to the castle and mentioned to his murdering brother how it was. Mr. Stars said it was all right. He bore no malice. He had kept out of the way in order that his murdering brother, to whose numerous virtues he was no stranger, might enjoy the property. And now he would propose that they should make it up and dine together. The murdering brother immediately consented, embraced the wild wanderer, and it is supposed sent instructions to Doctors Commons for a license to marry her. After which they were all very comfortable indeed, for it is not much to try to murder your brother for the sake of his property, if you only suborn such a delicate assassin as Michael the Mendicant. All this did not tend to the satisfaction of the child of mystery and the man of crime, who was so little pleased by the general happiness that he shot Will Stanmore, now joyfully out of prison and going to be married directly to May Morning, and carried off the body, and May Morning to boot, to a lone hut. Here Will Stanmore laid out for dead at fifteen minutes past twelve p.m., arose at seventeen minutes past, infinitely fresher than most daisies, and fought two strong men single-handed. However, the wild wanderer, arriving with a party of male wild wanderers, who were always at her disposal, and the murdering brother arriving arm-in-arm -arm with Mr. Stars, stopped the combat, confounded the child of mystery and the man of crime, and blessed the lovers. The adventures of Red Riven the Bandit concluded the moral lesson of the evening. But feeling by this time a little fatigued, and believing that we already discerned in the countenance of Mr. Whelks a sufficient confusion between right and wrong to last him for one night, we retired. The rather, as we intended to meet him shortly at another place of dramatic entertainment for the people. End of the Amusement of the People, number one.